Good afternoon. Boy, that works, doesn't it? <laughs> First of all, thank all of you for coming out on what a beautiful Central PA day. And uh, God only knows how many more are sitting out there yet. Um, but we can't really delay too much longer because we need to be out of here. The building closes at 5 o'clock. So uh, we need to wrap this up. So we certainly want to make sure we give everybody their allotted time. Uh, but welcome to the second quarterly discussions on military history uh, here at the Army Heritage and Education Center. Most of you know what this place is all about. Uh, it's the Army story, and certainly you should go take a look if you haven't been through the museums, um, the special exhibit they have on the second floor. You really should go up and take a look at that. Uh, but I am going to keep my comments uh, very short to, again, allow maximum time. But one thing, um, as I was coming down here today, I thought we haven't done before that we need to do. Next week, we celebrate the fabulous day in American history. And I think, especially for those of you who are veterans, those of you who aren't but love this country, um, I think we'd like to start this out and the subsequent ones with the Pledge of Allegiance. This is the best flag we could get, but you know what? It's the best flag there is. So if you would like to stay and do the pledge with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Real quickly, our next discussions program uh, on September 12th, we will have uh, retired um, Marine Corps General James Conway. He's a 34th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps. On December 5th, we will have Andrew Jackson O'Shaughnessy, who will be speaking on his book, The Men Who Lost America. Um, I do have some business cards that I'll put up here at the speaker's table. I would welcome any comments, uh, suggestions for what you saw here today or for any future programs that you would like to see. I'm going to start by our format here, is, as you well know, is to have the speaker talk for about 40, 45 minutes. Then we'll turn it over to um, our panelist who will go in a little deeper and question him with some you know, much more in-depth questioning and also to take questions from the audience. This is being recorded, so you could probably see yourself on a YouTube video at some point, so keep that in mind. But uh, to start out with our panelists here, uh, Dr. James Broussard is a uh, professor of history at Lebanon Valley College. His research and publications concentrate on the Jefferson Jackson era, uh, the South, and American politics. He has served as executive director for the Historians of the American Republic. Um, he's the author of three books. His latest is on Ronald Reagan, Champion of Conservative America. Next, we have Jessica Sheets. Jessica works here at the archives at the uh, Military History uh, Institute at the Education Center. She is a PhD student in American Studies at Penn State. Um, her dissertation will examine families divided by American Revolution, which I think is very timely and very thought-provoking as you just think about that, and we look at that from mostly a perspective of the Civil War, but American Revolution, certainly. Uh, she has published in the Military History and Military Heritage magazines um, on the 1781 Siege of Yorktown and in the Journal of Cumberland County History on the Continental Army Major James Armstrong. To her right, we have Scott Hill, um, Scott is the uh, Chief of Interpretation of uh, George Washington's birthplace in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Scott has a BA degree in history from Metropolitan State College in Denver. He travels a lot. Um, he's got a master's degree in American history from George Mason University. Uh, and he's been with the National Park System for, was it, what's it, Scott, 22 years? 22 years. Uh, he's been in Fredericksburg, Spotsylvania, Richmond, Petersburg, CNO Canal. So he's, he's certainly been around. Um, he was a museum tech at the Holocaust Museum. Uh, he's been filmed for C-SPAN and Fox News about the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. He's got several articles published um, and also teaches at the American, well, the US, he teaches US and American military history at the College of Southern Maryland. 
So now to move on to our speaker. Uh, when I started this whole program, it was going to be a program on the American Revolution Roundtable. And uh, we put an ad in the Journal of the American Revolution. And the first response I got was from Ken Degler, um, saying about his book and he would like to come and speak. And uh, we very, very much appreciate that. And certainly, um, you know, it's, it's been a fascinating book and they are available at the bookstore. He will sign them here at the end today. But Ken is retired CIA operations officer. He carries BA in history from Center College of Kentucky. He has a master's in history from Maxwell's School at Syracuse, at Syracuse University, and he served in the US Marine Corps. So you want to see our next program, Ken. Um, he has uh, written for the CIA's Historical Journal, Studies in Intelligence, and also in the Association of Former Intelligence Officers, um, Intelligencer, uh, as well as other pu publications. So without going any further, I'm going to turn this program over to Ken Dagler. Ken? <clears throat> Let me start by stating that I do not claim to be a historian, far from it. What I claim to be is somebody who has some experience in human intelligence. My background is about 35 years as a, what we call in the trade a human officer. My job was, very simply, as a case officer or operations officer. And now, I understand, shows how old I'm getting, they call it the classical training approach to recruiting, handling securely and productively individuals who have access to the plans and intentions of foreign adversaries. Now, since there weren't as many drones and as much radio communication during the Revolutionary War, and most of the stuff was done in terms of human interaction or documents, I find that I feel I can say, well, I'm not a historian and therefore can't put all of the pieces together, that I can analyze a lot of what was going on from the viewpoint of how those operations were run. And one of the reasons I wanted to speak to this, to this round table is because I don't think the intelligence point of view is often given the view, I won't say the credit, but the view, the image that it really should have in putting acts of the revolution into a much larger point of view. But again, I'm coming at this as an intelligence officer, not as a historian. Now, a metaphor for me is this statue. I think most people in this room would recognize that this is Nathan Hale. This is one of about 200 statues with two different poses, most of which were given out by the fleet, I think it's the Fleet Reserve Naval Officers Corps after World War II. And the one I'm most familiar with is a pose exactly like this that sits in front of the main entrance to the original headquarters building of the CIA. So for about 32 years, every day I'd walk by and I would see this particular statue. What do we know about Nathan Hale? I think we all know that he died for his country, which makes him certainly a good patriot. But most of what we've learned about Nathan Hale really is sort of incorrect. For example, there are no known physical portraits of Nathan Hale. So all of the 200 are sort of visualized, noble, images we have that don't necessarily look exactly like him. The famous quote, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country, I think a lot of people know, is a misquote, something taken out of a play called Cato, which was a popular play of the time. There is no reason to actually believe he said that. And I'm about to further deconstruct our, our national hero here. But before I do that, let me indicate that one thing he should be known for is that he fought very bravely during the Long Island and Manhattan battles. He was chosen and accepted by Knowlton's Rangers, which is the first military intelligence agency that the Army claims is basically their military predecessors going back to 1776. And of course, he very nobly did die. And the individuals who observed, and there were three different accounts of, of his demeanor as he was hanged, 
indicated that he died with the dignity you would expect. Let me read you a quote that I think really indicates why we ought to have some respect for this guy. I am not influenced, this has to do with his volunteering for the mission. I am not influenced by the expectation of promotions or pecuniary rewards. I wish to be useful and every kind of service necessary to the public good becomes honorable by becoming necessary. That says as much about him as a hero. Now, having said that, as a spy, he stunk. This is, we used to tell our young case officers when we use this as a case model, study how Nathan Hale was brought into the service, how he was trained, what his mission was, what his retirements, uh, requirements were, et cetera, and do everything completely differently, you might have a chance for an operation. Because this poor guy's mission was a failure before it ever started. He was given no training whatsoever. Probably the worst personality trait he had, like a good Ivy Leaguer, was he couldn't tell a lie. Well, let me tell you from personal experience, you don't want to send somebody behind enemy lines if they can't tell a lie, because it's sort of counterproductive. So the poor guy really was ill-suited to his job. And yet he's probably the best known American spy we have. By the time we get done today, I think you're going to know a few others. This is the uh, book jacket of my book. Very nice graphic design. You know, a book is a little bit like having a child in that you spend an awful lot of time with it and you really become very much involved in it. And after we had done all the drafts and had all the editorial comments and had the final written form, they brought me in at Georgetown University Press and said, sit down with the graphic design guys and gals and tell them what you want. And I was really happy, and I spent, I think, probably 15 or 20 minutes talking in great detail of how I wanted to project a cover that would say exactly what I wanted to say in terms of a message. But they ignored me, and they, and, and they used that anyway. So it actually worked out fairly well. Now, one thing I do like about the cover is you can see it from a long way off. This book came out last summer. And I happened to be down at Rehoboth Beach taking a vacation. And I decided that every day I would walk around and I'd see who was reading my book. Because you're going to know who your target audience is. So for two weeks, every day, a couple times a day, wandered back and forth looking at who was reading my book. Very interesting development. I can tell you with what I would think is probably 99.9% .9 accuracy that teenage girls were not my target audience for this particular book. I could find nobody reading it whatsoever. But I do have two target audiences. Like all good intelligence officers, you've got to know your target. And you all represent one of them, people who are interested in the revolution, for reasons I indicated before. Because just as politics, personality, military capability, other things all blend into all the events in the revolution, there is an intelligence insight here and one that I hope when we're done today may give you a slightly different perspective on why things sort of developed the way they did, why some things were done the way they were. Then secondly, my target audience is actually fellow intelligence professionals, and I speak to several organizations that are full of retired intelligence officers and some active, because the principles of human tradecraft have not changed since almost biblical times. So lessons from here, not unlike Nathan Hale and what not to do, are very much present throughout the book. Let me give you a prime example of this with one of the key points of protecting sources and methods. And that's the very careful compartmentation of the collector, the most sensitive part of any intelligence operation, and the intelligence officer who directs it, assimilates the information, and passes it on to policymakers. Let me tell you how it was done by the most sophisticated network of spies that George Washington ran during the revolution. That would be the Culper Ring, run in New York City with numerous agents, safe houses, all sorts of support mechanisms. A collector in New York City, and it could have been a tailor named Hercules Mulligan, 
who happened to have married a woman who was related to a British admiral, also happened to make clothes of such a good style that all the British senior officers and officials came to him and sat in his little salon as he measured them and they drank coffee and what have you. Or it could be an individual named Robert Townsend who was a merchant and also ran a coffee shop with the King's printer, James Rivington, all of these type of collectors as well as many others. They would get their information. They would then go back, let's say Robert Townsend, for example, he would go back to the boarding house where he was staying and he would write up as succinctly as possible the information he wanted to send along. Then he would basically go back either into town or back out in the Long Island where he was conducting business as well. But he would leave the information in the boarding house, what we call a safe house. About two days later, someone else traveling into New York from Long Island with the proper reason for coming in, personal business, legal business, or some logical reason, would go to that same boarding house. And because the boarding house was under the control of the culpers, that information would then be given to that individual. That individual could use secret ink called stain in those days or some other way of masking the information in a manner that allowed that person to carry it back out. And they would pass through lines after a couple days of doing legitimate business with that information back up to Long Island. And on the way back to their hometown, they would stop for a rest, normally around dusk in a cow pasture, and sit under a big oak tree. And at the base of that oak tree, there was a hole. They would put that information in a bottle or in a container of some kind or a leather pouch, and they put that in the hole. And they would go into town to a tavern where Everyone knew they were back in town because they, had, they were there at the tavern having drinks. The next day, a woman would go out to hang up her, her clothing to dry. And it so happened that her clothing line was, was viewable from the Connecticut side of Long Island Sound. And the manner in which she hung up her clothing to dry indicated that the drop, the dead drop, the, the communication information itself, was in the location by the tree. That evening, an individual from Connecticut will get in a whaleboat, go across Long Island Sound, go to the tree under cover of darkness, pick up the documents, take it back across Long Island Sound, and give it to a dragoon from Benjamin Talmadge's Connecticut Dragoons. And that dragoon would then deliver it to George Washington's headquarters. Very sophisticated way of compartmenting the collector from the individual who uses it. Not unlike what was done in World War II and frankly what was done in the Cold War in many cases. Now I'll tell you how it's done today. Today if I were a spy, I would probably collect my information and go to a Starbucks and sit at a Starbucks and after inserting a thumb drive that had a word program on it that ensured that my word processing did not go on a hard drive of my computer, I would type up the information I wanted to send. I would then either encrypt it using the same thumb drive or I'd attach it to a JPEG as a type of data entry. I would then, using the IP address of the Starbucks, send it to a site on Romanian quilts, some blog or some site that is somewhat esoteric. I would then fold up my laptop, take my thumb drive, and I would leave. Within a given period of time, the intelligence officer, say sitting in a European country, would simply go onto that same website, look for my message, download the attachment or a portion of the message, decode it, and have the information. The technology has changed, but the principle behind it has not. And we're going to see that principle in much of what we do here. Two hundred and fifty years ago this year, the British government decided they would try to impose the Stamp Act on uh, the colonies. The first direct tax that was not uh, at least discussed or legislated within the colonies. 
What we have here is an organization that grew up almost spontaneously out of the stamp, the stamp tax. That's the Sons of Liberty. Now, this is a print probably early 1774 because it depicts the, the uh, Tea Party. Now, there were several, but probably the Boston Tea Party. You have a drunken mob forcing tea down a tarred and feathered either Tory official or more British government official of some kind. Most historians look at the Sons of Liberty as just kind of a mob, sort of a collective name that doesn't represent much. As an intelligence officer, I look at it much differently. I look at the Sons of Liberty as a United Front organization. And in the course of 10 years, took a large group of individuals who were arguing and supporting everything from not stopping smuggling to putting taxes on certain items to simply dissatisfaction with local administration. And because the organizational group had a much stronger, firmer desire for political independence, molding it into that until they actually had taken and changed the course of the way this group operated. And they operated by late 1766 in virtually every major city and in a lot of the small towns. And a man who certainly is the father of this and was one of the key organizers of a lot of the activities that I'm going to show you is a gentleman named Sam Adams. Most historians will say that Sam Adams was indeed the father of the American Revolution. As an intelligence officer, I will tell you that I think Sam Adams was the Lenin of the American Revolution because of the organization, particularly political, and the manner in which you did it. Let me show you what the Sons of Liberty accomplished in a short 10-year period from 1765. Starting out with political action in the street. Never underestimate the value in a revolution of mob violence. By the time the Stamp Act was supposedly to be in place in 1766, there were no officials who were willing to enforce it. They had all been intimidated by mobs, either in the street, in some cases attacking their homes, in all cases threatening them, both physically as well as in print. Intercolonial communication. As you all know, Benjamin Franklin had a great role in creating a postal system before he actually moved to England. The Sons of Liberty used this extensively, enhanced it with paid post riders, used fast coastal shipping to ensure that they could get the same message or the coordinated position from 65 right through 72 and up to 75 all the way from Boston down to Charleston. Propaganda, propaganda being the key to them always getting the same message, whether it's put out in New York City or in Boston or in Marblehead or in Williamsburg. They were excellent at this because the first thing they did was they re recruited the newspaper publishers, who then worked out another communication system that allowed for the reprint of the same description of an article or of a position to go throughout the entire colonies. They were so good at this that let me use the 1770 Boston Massacre as an example of this. The Sons of Liberty's write-up, their position on what transpired during the Boston Massacre with all the brutality and other blood-curdling effects they could put into it, they were able to get to London two weeks before the official British version ever got there, which meant that all the newspapers in London, and indeed the king and his group, all had to read the Sons of Liberty's perspective before the official British position, which is frankly a little bit more honest, actually came out. Leadership positions. Now, starting about 1770, it was fairly obvious that a lot of the legislation was having difficulties. The royal governors were having problems getting things stamped, getting things put in position. And from about 1772 to 1775, a lot of the administrative and legislative and official organization started to die out, simply because the crown could no longer control it. But you still needed some type of local admin, 
So a shadow government grew up, if you would. And it was the Sons of Liberty whose individuals took over positions of authority in those areas. You look at almost any leader in any one of the cities and you'll find they were, they were members of the Sons of Liberty. Paramilitary actions, again, one of the first things that they did, and particularly in the military organizations, was they created the Minuteman companies. Minuteman companies were unusual in that it created an individual who was supposed to arrive at a given location, not only well armed in terms of a weapon and ammunition, but also able to carry provisions so that he could and had agreed to move with his body of people outside of their administrative district in support of someone else. It was an offensive capability that didn't always exist with the traditional militia groups. Also, paramilitary in the sense of, particularly from 72 onward, making sure that when possible, they would steal whatever they could from the royal arsenals, which they did a very good job of, particularly in 73 and 74. And now we get into the two areas that really demonstrate the aspect of United Front from an intelligence point of view. First is security for activities, committees of safety, starting about 1773. Committees of safety, which again, very quickly were able to communicate and coordinate in the various cities, were defensive in nature. It was their job to monitor what the British were doing, particularly where British had troops, so that they could ensure that their leadership was protected from arrest, always a threat if the, if the government was going to take that route. And equally important, particularly in 74 and 75, making sure they knew that the British weren't going to actually have the gall to try to get back some of the ammunition, some of the gunpowder, some of the weapons that they had stolen. Secondly, September, uh, late, late fall of uh, 1774, we did an organization put together called the Mechanics which if you want to be a little extrapolative, you could say it was the first American intelligence organization because their job was not defensive. Their job was to find out the plans and intentions of General Gage in Boston, which they frankly did. They had two leaders, both of whom were senior members of the Sons of Liberty as well, of course. First, Dr. Joseph Warren. Secondly, Dr. Benjamin Church. In Dr. Warren's case, Dr. Warren managed to have at least two penetrations of General Gage's command structure. We know of one who was a, a male official, the second one we're not too sure about. Now, let me give you a slightly different perspective on the shot heard around the world and the resulting retreat of the British forces down Battle Road back into Boston. Because these two organizations play a rather interesting role. Everybody knows what happened in, in April at Concord. Notice that's a Boston pronunciation, by the way. I used to say Concord, and I was told too many times I gotta say Concord. In any event, uh, in March of that year, General Gage sent two of his officers to reconnoiter what possible targets he might actually go after. He dressed them in what, what is described as rustic brown, which I believe was sort of long brown coats and round hacks, which is what the, the people outside of Boston tended to wear. They went out through Cambridge and out to Watertown. The first time is they were going out to a, an area in the center of the state call, up there called Wooster. We pronounce it Worcester, but they call it Wooster. However, when they got to Watertown, they stopped in a tavern. And in the tavern, a black serving woman, and it's not at all clear whether she was a free black or whether she was a slave, but nevertheless, she was a serving person. She recognized who they were, and she told the local members of the Committee of, Sa of uh, Safety. Consequently, when these two officers went out to Wooster, they were surveilled and monitored during the entire route out and the entire route back. Everyone they spoke to and where they went and what they looked at was carefully noted by the Committee of Safety. Two weeks later, General Gage sent them out once again, but this time through Cambridge to Lexington and Concord. Same thing happened. They were identified to the Committee of Safety. They were monitored, as was their route, whom they spoke with. So now the Committee of Safety 
happens to know exactly what routes are going to be taken to and from the two objectives that Gage might stimulate an action against. Then we get uh, the mechanics. The mechanics, through Dr. Warren, learn well before the troops actually disembark that it's going to be Lexington and Concord. Now, this puts a slightly different perspective on the story of how the Minutemen and then eventually militia companies were able to operate. And modern historians will tell you they operated not just in company size, but in regimental size, coordination, how they were able to set up the various ambushes along Battle Road as the British troops went back from Concord through Lexington into Boston and why they took such heavy casualties. Because the Patriots knew the route they were going to take and they knew what the objective was. So it was not that hard, or at least say it's not as mystic to assume why they were able to collectively come together so quickly and be so effective. There we go. Now, if you're going to start a revolution, you normally need a little bit of logistical background and a little bit of expertise. And unfortunately, we did not have much of that. So we needed a mature partner. And the mature partner that we picked up on was the French government, which had its own issues with the British that had very little to do with our desire for democracy. But the three individuals who were the keystone of what became an incredibly important covert action program for two years were first, of course, Benjamin Franklin, dressed in the outfit he liked to wear in public when he was the head of America's first diplomatic mission abroad, the Paris Commission. Here he likes to portray himself as the frank and honest and plain American, unlike those fops, the British, who are always devious and what have you. Here we have Robert Morris, who, as most of you know, was the treasurer of the revolution. It was Morris's job to get the money to pay back the French for all of the armament and other things they were sending over. And thirdly, we have an individual you may not recognize as, as well. This is Pierre Augustine Caron Beaumarchais. If that name means anything to you, it might have more to do with the fact that as an artist, he wrote two plays which became famous operas, The Barber of Seville and The Marriage of Figaro. However, he also headed up an incredible front company known as Tortelez and Company that provided incredible numbers of arms, munitions, expertise, and other things to the American army, which they could not have survived without. Like all good conspiracies, at least in my way of thinking, it started on a dark and stormy night in Philadelphia in December of 1775, when Ben Franklin and two other members of the newly formed secret committee met a Flemish merchant in Carpenter Hall and over the course of three or four nights, with the thunder clapping, and I, I think one newspaper even reported white lightning of, of one kind or another, they discussed exactly what each side was willing to do. The secret agent, not Paul Marche, but the secret agent, the Flemish individual who was reporting back to the King of France, wanted to know two things. Are you serious about what you're going to do, and can you actually accomplish it? Now, we're talking December 1775. We're not talking July 1776. But what did Franklin promise? He promised, number one, we will seek political independence from Great Britain. Number two, we'll beat the British Army. A little optimistic in the second point, to be honest with you. But nevertheless, in turn, the French agent promised that the ports of France would be open to American interests, and that some organization would be worked out that would provide supplies necessary for the American conducting of the war, additional, additional logistics that went on. But what the result of this was, he says, is Hortelez and Company, which over the course of two years 
as a commercial cover entity, giving the government of France plausible denial as most of the armament came directly out of their own arsenals, both gunpowder and weapons, allowed the transfer of what in effect was millions of dollars in those days of supplies. Utilizing over 100 sailing ships, we're not talking about a small deal here, we're talking about a massive attempt to somehow keep military supplies to keep the Continental Army in the field. Gunpowder, the US America at that point had virtually no capability to produce a great deal of gunpowder, period. Barely enough for hunting purposes. Most of it had to be imported, and the British since 1774 had been cutting back on allowing importation. It is estimated by historians that 80% of the gunpowder used by the American side at the Battle of Saratoga was imported by this company. It was doubtful without them that that battle could have been fought. Muskets, cannon. Obviously, there was no arms industry. The colonies was not an industrial center. As a colony, they used industrial products from Great Britain and other parts. A lot of people tend to think that the American army was sort of like the British army and carried the brown best rifle. They didn't. The weapon the Continental Line carried was a French model of the muskets because they came literally directly out of the French arsenal. Other military supplies, again, no capability to produce that in the colonies. Everything's from uniforms to tents to whatever else you needed. And finally, technical expertise, which is particularly interesting because there's always a debate whenever contractors are hired by the US military to do anything. Yet, if you're going to fight a war in those days, you needed to know how to make fortifications, which involves some type of engineering education and if you're going to be an, an artillery individual, you had to have some sense of math and a little bit of physics. And of course, we had no schools to train that. So instead, the technical expertise was in the form of contracts for a great many foreign officers from Austria, from Germany, from Spain, from France, from Italy, who came over and served at various ranks and in various posts with the American army right through the entire revolution. You're familiar with a lot of them. Lafayette, obviously, you're very familiar with. You're familiar with uh, L'Enfant, uh, DeKalb. DeKalb's a very fascinating one because DeKalb's slightly different. DeKalb actually was sent over with Lafayette in a bit of a secret agent role where he was supposed to report back honestly what the American forces were able to accomplish and what their plans were because like any any nation that is supporting it, Ben Franklin may have not always been telling him the truth. Having said that, DeKalb did die leading American troops, so he was very much a part of it. Here. Well, it is very doubtful that the Continental Army could have stayed in the field without this type of support. They were suffering from something as simple as a lack of gunpowder at Bunker Hill, and by the time they got chased out of Long Island and Manhattan and over across to Hudson, the number of, of shocks that each soldier, admittedly a small group at that point then, but that the, each soldier had was, was incredibly small. When they attacked Trenton, most of the troops had about four shocks. That's all the gunpowder they had. Let me finish up this part of it by telling you, uh, we're gonna move forward a little bit, but telling you, uh, a story because a French historian actually told me this. When you get to World War I, you've got Blackjack Pershing with a very famous quote. As American doughboys are going back into the front in France, his quote is, Lafayette, we are here. Okay, there is a very famous political cartoon. Let me describe it to you. It shows a raging surf, boats landing on a beach that obviously is a French beach with the hillside behind it. And you've got the American doughboys with the tin flat hacks and their leggings and the Enfields and the, the book plus bayonets looking determined coming and landing on the shore. And in the background above them, you've got a caricature of Persian and his voice is saying, Lafayette, we are here. And above the coasts of France, you've got a caricature of Lafayette who was looking there saying, welcome. Well, the French historian made a point to me. He told me that if that political cartoon had been correct, 
Lafayette's voice would have been, yes, but did you bring your checkbooks? Because we never repaid their loans for the equipment that Hortelez and company gave us. Robert Morris tried very hard, but he could not get the agro agricultural products from the various colonies that he had hoped he could then send to Europe to sell for repayment. We ought to keep that in mind next time we get upset about someone else welching on a loan that we made for them. <clears throat> Anytime you talk about the revolution, you gotta talk about George Washington, a remarkable individual. But from the viewpoint of intelligence, you don't read much about him. There's 20, 30 really good biographies that look at him as a person, that look at him as a military leader, look at him as a politician, just as a statesman. But if you ever look in the back, look under intelligence, look under spies, you're going to find, you know, Hale and Arnold and X about it. Yet this is a guy, and again, economies of scale play into this, but this is a guy who was both the prime consumer of all the intelligence as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army, and also the prime case officer who ran, often on a very minute level, most of the larger spying operations. A remarkable feat that today economies of scale would never allow to be done. Let me tell you the skills that this guy brought, as we say, to the battle. Observation and analysis. Again, today we've got overhead, we've got air breathers, we've got drones. You can take a look at something almost 3D. Well, in those days that Washington had to do the observation, you'd sit on a hilltop covered by trees, looking maybe half to a quarter of a mile across the valley at an installation, and you'd have to figure out what their fields of fire were, what their defensive area looked like, what type of troops might be there based on provisional wagons, based on transportation like canoes, based on the comings and goings of it. A much more difficult task, but one he did very well. Elicitation. Elicitation is one of the five ways of obtaining information orally. And it is the most sophisticated because when it's done correctly in a social scenario, the individual who is the target of the elicitation doesn't even know it's been done. They just assume that they've had a shared conversation of one kind or another. Disinformation, excellent at disinformation. Washington was so good at this that he would tell his own junior officers who were not involved in implementing his actual plans, false plans, or confuse them with false details, knowing that many of them talked to individuals who might get information back to the British, or at worst, and this is probably more common, people gossip, and when they gossip, information always gets out. Debriefing, another one of the five forms, but it requires comprehensive records and notes to handle a good debriefing. And Washington was extremely good at this. He would have a lot of good notes on the order of battle, on a chronology of events, so that when he asked questions of certain individuals or sent information back through a double agent system, he had very specific requirements to accomplish. Defensive counterintelligence, what we call operational security, made my job very difficult because was, he was very, very good at it. We know so little, really, about intelligence agents, what their missions were, and what they accomplished because he was so good at compartmenting very carefully, even in his official records and even in his instructive correspondence. Propaganda, excellent at propaganda. Uh, much like disinformation, he made it a habit, for example, after Trenton and Princeton, when he was sending back paroled officers to march them by certain villages where he had already given instructions that the forces there were to create a larger than life type of situation in terms of their size. Some involved false marching around with different flags and in different formations. Some involved illumination of, of massive uh, buildings where no one really was staying, etc. He was using this all the time. Asian recruitment, very good at that, and then deception. And deception, particularly strategic deception, he used throughout the war. And that is the highest, most sophisticated form of offensive counterintelligence because it requires three specific 
type of capabilities. Number one, you've got to have double agents in the British camp that they already trust. So you can pass information that is believable and accepted. It can't just be somebody who walks in. It has to be an established pattern. Number two, you've got to have firm control over the message you put out to your own people because definitely there's going to be leaks and the enemy is going to understand what you're telling your own people. Often he misled his own people. Interesting aspect of the whole Benedict Arnold recruitment, or walk-in actually writing, with the British was that one of the reasons John Andre finally believed that Benedict Arnold was ready to commit treason and move to the other side was because of information he gave that he had just gotten from Washington, which subsequently turned out to be disinformation that Washington was passing not because he didn't trust Arnold, but because he always passed disinformation or confused information to individuals not directly involved in implementation of a plan. And thirdly, you had to have your own penetrations who could collect on the British so you knew what they were doing and how they were responding to the message you were sending so you could fine tune it or stimulate it. And as you're gonna see a couple times during the war, he did this as well as anything they ever did in World War II. What is most interesting about what Washington brings to the war in terms of these skills is that he demonstrated these skills as early as 1753 to 1755 during the French and Indian War. All you have to do is read his journal. So by the time he was actually commander in chief, he'd known this stuff for 20 years. You had a pretty darn good idea how to do it. <clears throat> Let me take you to a point <clears throat> in history that I think you're pretty much all aware of. It has to do primarily with probably the worst period for Washington and American Revolutionary period. The British have now landed, they're pushing his troops back across Long Island, back out of Manhattan, over across to Hudson, into Pennsylvania, into New Jersey. Several positions are lost, thousands of troops are lost, supplies are lost. It's a constant period of retreat for three or four months. A couple of his biographers say he actually went into a depressed state during this as you might well expect. By the time we get to December, the weather's bad. He's down to very few effective men, maybe 5,000, maybe 6,000. Many of those are undersupplied, to say the least. It is not dramatic to say that by mid-December, when the snow was on the ground, if the army was marching, you saw blood, because they did not have boots in many cases. We're talking about a time when the end looks very near. Alistments are almost up. There is no morale, if there's no morale, there's no idea whether the Continental Congress, as ineffective as it is at that point, is going to be able to send new, new recruits in, whether the states will provide new volunteers. The militia in New York certainly had not demonstrated any great capability. So it's a very, very difficult time. Yet what does he do? He takes what's left of his troops and he attacks Trenton, and he succeeds, and that basically turns around the morale. He talks people into maintaining their enlistments a while longer. It's a morale victory. It upsets the British to no end. And basically, he keeps his army in the field for another year. In early December, Washington even considered the situation so bad that he was going to take what was left of his troops and try to march them into the Ohio country as a last resort and try to fight some kind of a guerrilla warfare. Lord knows how that would have worked out. But he turns it around. Why does he turn it around? Why does Washington suddenly have the confidence necessary to take troops in the state they're in, with the supply problems they have, considering weather conditions, and the way they have to cross a river and get to Trenton? Well, my opinion is because he finally had the confidence of enough good intelligence to make a decision. 
and here is the kind of intelligence he had. As I've mentioned before, he kept good order of battle records. Even while he was retreating, he kept good order of battle records. He knew the two Prussian eunuchs that were located at Trenton had been in the fight since Long Island, and they had been very aggressive. They were very tough troops, very aggressive indeed, but they had been fighting just like he had for three and a half months. They had taken casualties. They had a lot of sick, lame, and lazy still in, and because they were Prussians as opposed to British, it wasn't as easy to get reinforcements. Consequently, they were undermanned. Also, when they got in the Trenton, the New Jersey militia really rose up. Unlike the New York militia, the New Jersey militia did a great job. They immediately started harassing Colonel Rowell and his two, two regiments at Trenton. Immediately, every night, they would aggress, aggressively attack the outposts. They would fire into the barracks. They would cause faints to the point that they knew all the defensive positions, which frankly were not very well maintained. They knew all the outposts. They knew the patrol routes. They actually knew because of their faints what his marshalling ground was going to be for his main troops in case of an attack. Excellent job, all of which they passed along to General Washington. He also knew that these troops had been tired to start with and now literally many days in a row were sleeping on their weapons, not even getting any rest at night. If you've ever been in combat, you know what, what that means. So he knew the troops were not in the best condition in terms of numbers and in terms of physical and psychological condition. I should add they were not drunk. There is some rumor they were drunk because it was Christmas and that, that simply does not hold up. He also knew something about Colonel Rowell, the commander. Colonel Rowell was a very aggressive, arrogant Prussian, as indeed most British officers had very little respect not only for the Continental Army but for Americans at all. Colonel Rowell was very much like that. However, Colonel Rowell was a good, stubborn Prussian, and he directly refused British orders to fortify better the positions around Trenton. His response was, as reported to Washington, if they come, I will defend with my bayonet. And also, he did drink a little bit, which is an important element in this. Now, I also believe that in addition to all the information he had, Washington had from the New Jersey militia and his own records and his own scouting that he had a spy inside named John Honeyman. There is some, there's a historical debate about this because there is not the official documentation to support Honeyman's story. But I happen to believe, and I explain in the book why as an intelligence officer, I believe Honeyman did exist. Honeyman's role, if you will, if you believe it, was that as a cattle salesman, he was acting as a provisioner to the officer corps, at least, of the Prussian eunuchs and had developed a personal relationship or at least friendship by supplying things to Raoul as well. And consequently, he was able to come out a few days before the actual attack, give Washington the last up to date in terms of the morale and fighting status of the troops and also the mentality of Raoul. Any event, George Washington made the attack and I think that the reason he did it again his intelligence confidence, which is something that we often forget about as being vitally important, was one of the key elements there. Now, because of, of time, I'm going to quickly go over some of the other significant aspects of intelligence that I detail in the book. 1777, we have, we have sabotaged the British ports. Now, a gentleman named Jack the Painter made several valiant attempts to burn down various portions of British shipyards. He did this with the support of the Paris Commission as a volunteer. Not a really big deal, other than the fact that it brought home to some businessmen in Great Britain that there was a war going on. The interesting point about him as an agent of the American cause was that in addition to a little bit of money given him by the Paris Commission, the French government also gave him an alias French passport in the assumption he was going to get out. He never did make it out, however. Essex recruit in Philadelphia area. We've got two 
light cavalry officers, Major Alan McLean, Major John Clark, both of whom did initial scouting and under the guise of doing initial scouting also created an initial line of informants who could observe the British defensive lines on a daily basis from their homesteads, from their farms, and eventually also recruited agents who under the guise of business, much of it illegal, of supplying British troops with fresh food and what have you, were able to go into and out of British lines into Philadelphia where, indeed, because it had been the capital, a lot of people were willing to talk to them and provide information. So you had two separate networks working, one with McLean and one with Major Clark. And then you had one indigenous individual Lydia Darag, and again, this is a person who is not as well documented as most of the others we're going to talk about, but she was able to provide information because she had British officers staying in her house, and women in those days in that colonial structure, somewhat like Amer Afro-American slaves, were sort of not considered to be much more than wallpaper as people were talking, and there are countless times when, when women had performed that role in the revolution. She did it in Philadelphia and was able to use a system using her family of getting the information, often putting it in covered buttons and cloth, sending a boy out with food through the lines who would then meet with, with an officer and what have you. But until we get to August and October, we've got Saratoga. Uh, we've got two situations with Saratoga that people very often forget about. One is Fort Stanwyck, where Benedict Arnold was able to stop St. Ledger, another individual who was supposed to be reinforcing Burgoyne's organization, most importantly with a large number of Indians, as opposed to really a large number of, of, of uh, British legitimate forces and militia. And that's important because the militia, which was very important at the Battle of Saratoga, were pretty good about standing up to the actual lying elements of, of the British forces, but they were very much scared of the Indians because they'd had about 20 years experience with the very barbaric nature by our standards of what, of what Indian warfare was all about. Arnold used a ruse I discuss in the book regarding his understanding of Indian culture, a mentally ill individual who the, the Indians believe spoke, th spoke through God, and he, he basically convinced the Indians to defect from St. Ledger, who then had to pull back. The other one, of course, is the Battle of Bennington that stopped uh, Burgoyne from getting additional supplies and consequently strapping them down. At the uh, Battle of Bemis Heights itself, there was a British defector who came across at just the right time to provide the final details on a British plan, formation of attack, and also we had a local patriot, Alexander Bryan, who was able to go into British lines because he actually lives on a farmstead there and gained quite a bit of information that's discussed in the book. Let's see here. There we go. By 78, we've got John Paul Jones actually raiding Britain. First time in 100 years that anyone had actually raided a British uh, coastal town. He had a very good plan, it would have worked fairly well, but unfortunately one of the two raiding parties uh, was led by a, an individual who was Irish, and the ships that he was supposed to burn unfortunately were contiguous to a, a dockside tavern. And at that point he lost focus on what he had planned to do, and instead of going after the ships, they went after the tavern, and you know, that all happens. But, but uh, John Paul Jones succeeded in uh, spiking the guns, at the small defensive position they had, and more importantly, causing enough of a panic in the British insurance industry that they raised the rates significantly, which helped uh, create some movement among businessmen against the, the administration in Britain. We've got uh, the starting of the Culper Ring, and we've got Lieutenant Lewis Kosigen, who is another nasty character, who in his American uniform walks around New York City after he's been paroled, having been there for over a year as a parolee where he could not report what he saw, and he just continues to walk around, and now he's able to report because he's no longer paroled, he's been officially exchanged, and he kind of fills in the gap until the Culper Ring starts to going. By 79, we've got the, the Culper Ring starting to move very nicely, the recruitment of 
Robert Townsend as a second individual. We've got additional couriers, we've got additional collectors in there. We've got McLean once again at Stony Point, where he personally goes into Stony Point under the guise of being married to a woman whose son had recently defected to the British, and he is able to observe the positions at Stony Point, their, some of their weak positions, particularly on the side of, of, the, of the Hudson River, which allows Anthony Wayne subsequently to lead a bayonet charge, no firing of weapons whatsoever that uh, is a huge victory psychologically. Which, of course, interestingly enough, the Culper Ring is unable to report back uh, General Clinton's responses to that. By uh, 1780, we've got Culper Ring full operation, we've got Benedict Arnold exposed, we've got Major Andre hanged, very fascinating the way their correspondence goes back and forth, the role of, of uh, Arnold's wife, the beautiful Peggy Shippen, a Tory young lady in, in Philadelphia, very interesting there. We've got General Green assuming command in the Southern Army, and General Green, being a very smart guy, and having Washington as a mentor, rather quickly assumes the operational security awareness and the intelligence aggressive approach that Washington has used. And he's, a, and frankly, he's a little, bit, a little bit less careful about some of the sources. So we know probably about 25 of, of his intelligence officers by name, and we know a lot about the networks that each one of those had because his official correspondence is not quite as guarded. And by 1781, the Battle of Cowpens, a very important one. Famous General Daniel Morgan is the general in charge of that, and, Gen and Dan Morgan is able to make that set piece battle based on intelligence. First, he's very good at, at knowing the intelligence of his enemy. In this case, it was Tarleton, Bannister Tarleton, and he knew him very well. He also knew the, the British Legion forces that were with him, and thanks to Francis Swamp Fox Marion, two days before the set piece battle, he knew exactly the location of the other two major British elements, the one commanded by General Leslie and the one commanded by General Cornwallis, so he knew the Legion was unreinforceable during the battle. A Cornwallis moving into Virginia, you can see the strategic deception plan, incredibly well done because Washington had the assets in place to do it that allow for him to eventually get Cornwallis into a set piece battle. And by the time we get down into the Tidewater, from the time Arnold gets there until Cornwallis takes over, we've got indigenous spies working for a Colonel James Innes. We've got a false defector, a private Charles Morgan, who manages to keep them from moving north by giving false information about colonial capabilities. We've got two Afro-Americans, both of whom, interestingly enough, were officially members, in the case of Matthews, of the Virginia militia, and in the case of Armstead, of the Continental Army itself, who perform both collection missions and also disinformation missions that further keep Cornwallis steady. And then, of course, we've got the surrender at Yorktown. That's, there's a lot more detail in all of that, but as you can imagine, I could probably talk for more hours and you'd be interested in, in hearing about it. I did want to end up with one thing, if I can go back to it, well, okay, let's see here, folks. No, not going to let me go that way, okay, quickly go through. I said before there were lessons. Well, I was trying to think what kind of a lesson that fits in with the Army, and of course, considering the type of activities we're involved in, now it's the lessons of what you really need for an insurgency. And it's interesting that all of these characteristics are fairly well understood by everybody as what you need if an insurgency is going to, going to exist and going to prosper, and it's exactly what we had. The organizers of the Sons of Liberty were middle class guys. They certainly weren't farmers or anything else. They weren't proletariat, anything like that. A weak government presence, which is what the British had, not only militarily, but also administratively, the fact that we found a mature, for those days, industrialized nation as a partner, France, that could support us. The fact that Washington very quickly figured out after Trenton that he didn't have to win the war. He just couldn't lose it. And finally, that you're going to have 
if you want to win and not just make sure somebody else doesn't win, you got to normally have additional boots on the ground. And indeed, we had that when the French finally joined us with siege equipment for the set piece battle at, at uh, Yorktown. And of course, part of always winning an insurgency is the domestic political fatigue. And you had that in the British government. And O'Shaughnessy is going to talk about that. I just finished his book, and it's one of two really good books that shows you how fatigued the British government became with this entire, entire mess and how it affected their ability not to reinforce properly. And then finally, that no matter what happens, you're only a fool if you expect either repayment or gratitude in these kind of situations. It just doesn't happen. And that's about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You just stay here for a few minutes. Our okay. next part of the program, as you know, is uh, we'll have our three panelists um, make some comments, also ask some questions. Some will probably be difficult, some will probably be pretty easy. <laughs> um, and then we'll certainly open it up to the public. So we'll do about 15 minutes with the panel and <coughs> up to anyone who wants to ask any questions. So I guess, uh, Jim, you're going to sure. start off. Um, let me start off by saying that the core of this book, which is an analysis of the intelligence and counterintelligence operations uh, by the Americans and the British on both sides of the Atlantic, uh, by, is the first by someone who knows the intelligence field. Uh, and it's also the most thorough, I think, probably by anybody. Uh, my critique is going to focus on some of the peripheral points that the author makes that I think uh, it, it might have been a better book had they been left out. Um, but none of them, I want to say, affect the value of what he's really trying to get across. Uh, first, I wouldn't say the American Revolution is an insurgency in any sense in which we understand the word today. Uh, it's not, wasn't like the Taliban in Afghanistan or the uprising against uh, Assad or the Hucks in the Philippines in the 18, 1950s or the uh, communist uh, insurgency in Malaya in, after World War II or in Greece after World War II. It was really much more like the Civil War. Uh, it was an uprising against an existing government, but it was carried on by another existing government. Uh, the central government in Britain was 3,000 miles away. Um, all the governments in America were taken over and run during the entire revolution by the rebels themselves. They had their own executives, their own legislatures, their own military forces, their own sources of revenue. Uh, it was a war between essentially two nations. Um, there were some irregular, uh, there was some irregular war involved in some places and at some times, but it wasn't an insurgency like those of the 20th century, uh, I think, at all. Uh, secondly, I don't think it's uh, accurate to call the um, resistance forces before 1776 a united front. Uh, the united front, as again, as we understand it in the 20th century, is uh, a revolutionary force like the communists, for example, working with non-revolutionary groups that have totally different goals, uh, but using them as an expedient uh, to try to help the revolutionary goal along. Uh, there weren't a lot of groups with divergent goals resisting the British before the revolution. There was only one goal that all of them had, and that was to uh, defend what they thought were their liberties under the British Constitution against a government that they thought wasn't respecting those liberties. Um, the Sons of Liberty were not a revolutionary force. They did not set out during the Stamp Act or any time thereafter until the very, very end uh, to work for independence from Britain. The whole point of all this resistance was not that these people didn't want to be British. It was that they insisted they were just as damn good British as the people in Britain and were entitled to the same rights and the same treatment. And it's only really at the very end, in the, in the winter of 75-76, when Tom Paine's pamphlet Common Sense came out, that he essentially convinced them if you want your English liberties, you're going to have to stop being English because you're not going to get them uh, under this system. Because suppose you convince this government to back down, and this is all they were trying to do, even when Washington was leading the army before Boston. 
uh, was make the, the administration in Westminster back off of its policies and treat them the way they thought Englishmen should be treated. And Paine said, look, suppose you win uh, and go back to being good, loyal subjects. What do you do when the next prime minister comes along or the next king? You might have to fight this battle all over again indefinitely in the future as long as you have a government that's not fully under the control of the people. Um, so there were a scattered handful of people probably who uh, wanted independence before the winter of 75, but um, uh, certainly the Sons of Liberty were not uh, a revolutionary force in the sense that say the Communist Party was uh, in the Soviet Union before 1917. <clears throat> all their resistance was aimed at getting the government to back off and let's all go back to being good loyal Englishmen the way we want to be. Um, third, uh, he didn't mention it today, but the book uh, makes uh, a point that economic freedom was sort of the, uh, what should we say, <clears throat> the um, wrapping around which the Sons of Liberty uh, pushed the revolutionary movement forward. Uh, if you look at the scholarship on the coming of the revolution in the last generation, uh, you'll see that the whole idea of an economic cause for the revolution is uh, about a generation out of date. Uh, these people didn't want a revolution, they didn't want independence, they wanted their English liberties. And they had to be convinced by uh, repeated slapdowns, I guess, from the government that they finally weren't going to get those liberties if they stayed English. Um, but that again didn't, that opinion shift didn't happen until the winter of 75, 76. Um, and I think the, the part that, of the book, the major part that deals with the intelligence operations is really uh, not only good, but a revelation I think to a lot of people who only know, uh, well to anybody really, who doesn't spend you know, a career studying it. And that's why this thing is really valuable. But I'd like to have seen more on um, more specifics on how intelligence helped the Americans uh, on the battlefield. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, obviously good intelligence didn't keep Washington from being surprised by Howe's flank attack at Long Island uh, in 76, or surprised again by another flank attack by Howe uh, at Brandywine. Uh, it didn't help Washington win uh, at White Plains, or for that matter, the Americans win at Bunker Hill. Uh, it didn't help Gates uh, keep from losing at Camden or Charleston from falling or Green winning at Hobkirk's Hill or Utah Springs or 96. Uh, in fact, the only major times I can think where intelligence really helped on the battlefield were, uh, as he says, at Trenton uh, and, of course, Washington's uh, total befuddlement of the British when the way he got his entire army from New York down to Yorktown before the British even knew he was gone. Um, so it would be helpful to see um, uh, to have driven home better some more examples of how uh, good intelligence uh, helped on the battlefield. Although I think you could, you could probably make a good argument, and perhaps he does in the book, that a lack of good intelligence is, for instance, one of the things that uh, cost us Charleston. I mean, uh, how anybody would s keep their army there when it should be painfully obvious that the British were going to uh, come in from land and sea and trap them, I, I don't understand. So uh, I'll just say again, I, I have some quibbles with some peripheral points the author tries to make, but uh, I think if you look at what the book is really all about, it's uh, an amazing effort. And I think uh, historians would benefit, and, and especially average you know, readers who really will find out uh, on a lot of interesting and very useful information. Due to my research interest in family divisions in the Revolution, I appreciated reading about British Major British General Thomas Gage's wife, Margaret Kemble Gage, born in New Jersey, who may have passed information to the Patriots. American popular culture has given more attention to Peggy Shippen Arnold, the loyalist wife of Benedict Arnold, perhaps because of Benedict, Ar Benedict Arnold's infamy in American history. I especially like the accounts of women involved in intelligence who are integrated throughout the book, some confirmed and others speculation. In late 1776, a housemaid helped counterintelligence agent Enoch Crosby escape confinement in a house. In March 1777, counterintelligence officer Nathaniel Sackett, who ran New York City operations, 
used a woman married to a Tory to observe and gather information on British activities. And Mr. Degler commented um, about Lydia Dara, a member of a Quaker family in Philadelphia who with her husband and at least two of her sons were part of intelligence operations. And he also brought up uh, how Captain Alec McLean used um, a woman to gain entrance to the British camp at Stony Point in July 1779. So clearly many women had an impact on military operations besides Anna Strong and Agent 355 of the Culper Ring who have gained more attention recently due to books and television. Scholarship in more recent decades such as Linda Kerber's Women of the Republic and Mary Beth Norton's Liberty's Daughters have drawn attention to the role of women in the American Revolution as movers and shakers in their own right. Mr. Degler's book helps us to see the entire intelligence picture and its complexity. Without women, certain spy rings would not have been as effective, and surely there were other American patriot women who eavesdropped on conversations, hit agents, transport information, and in other ways supported the patriot cause. And the same can be said for African Americans, men and women, who feature an entire chapter in his book. Their dedication and skills netted certain critical intelligence otherwise unobtainable. And he mentioned the African American tavern maid who in 1775 alerted Boston patriots that British General Gage and his officers were looking for patriot military stores. So I enjoyed Mr. Degler's book and do have a few questions if we have time. Um, due to my work in the archives, I'm especially interested in his archival research. Um, he mentioned a few archives in historical societies in his acknowledgments, and I'm curious, once he determined to write a book about this topic that he was interested in, how he went about his research in these facilities and what archives and primary sources he found most useful and why. And I'll just throw out my other questions about women if he has time to get to them. Did any particular woman stand out to you, Mr. Degler, as an intelligence professional? Were there any whose stories did not make it into your book, and if so, why not? Thank you. So I, uh, I liked how Mr. Degler stated out front that he was not a historian. And I think most of the books that come out on spying and intelligence in the revolution are written by historians. So I found it refreshing to see a, a quote, non-historian, although I, I do beg to differ a little bit. I think that there's plenty of, of history in this, Mr. Daigler, and I think that you do qualify for uh, the role of a, a historian. But I found it interesting that you, know, you took the intelligence aspect as a career officer in the CIA. Uh, you brought a completely different point of view than, than many other books uh, that came out on this topic. So what I found uh, very interesting about the book, and I did like it a, a great deal, what I found very interesting about the book was that you not only took those stories of the individuals that we knew well, Nathan Hale, um, Benedict Arnold, um, and, and sort of brought not only what we had known before, but added a, a few new components, or at least new to me, uh, and then added them to stories of individuals that uh, are, are lesser known. Um, my only quibble with it, and it's, it's not large, is that like uh, studying the Civil War, you always read about the Army of the Potomac and the Eastern Front and the Civil War. You hardly read anything about the Western theater. Why do we only hear about the northern campaigns of the revolution and, and very little about the southern campaigns. I mean, George Washington stops fighting in June of 1778. Tomorrow's the anniversary of the Battle of Monmouth. And between Monmouth and Yorktown, Washington is not doing a whole heck of a lot in the north. Most of the action is coming down south. And the only quibble is that there's not a whole great amount of information about the south. I'm passionate about the, the southern campaigns. I think the intelligence failures in the South is because of the uh, rather um, um, insignificant American leaders that are down there, like your Horatio Gates and your Benjamin Lincoln, who, again, I think uh, Jim pointed out, how do you get bottled up in Charleston uh, with 5,000 soldiers? Obviously, a lack of intelligence there. Uh, but when Nathaniel Green comes in, I think he's able to utilize uh, Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter and Andrew Pickens in ways that the other generals before him did not. So I would have just liked to have seen a little bit more in the South. And 
I think Mr. Daigler makes a great point about African Americans. Uh, there's not a whole heck of a lot of knowledge on African American intelligence activities during the war. I think the chapter in there was fascinating, and I think it's more detailed than many others. Um, and James Armistead is a, a fascinating figure. So I think the book was, was very well written um, as a non-intelligence officer. Um, some of the, uh, the, the tech, or technical uh, language in there kind of went over my, over my head, but uh, I thought it was fascinating, and it's a, it's a great addition to any uh, Revolutionary War books on, on intelligence. I have one question that I to throw in. How would you rate Washington compared to the British command in terms of their handling of intelligence? My impression is Washington ran rings around them. Is that an accurate perception? What would you like me to do now? <laughs> Respond? <laughs> uh, well, to the, to the latter part, I, I rate Washington as an excellent intelligence manager. Washington is a remarkably unique individual. He was a man of his time, so there are a lot of things he can be criticized for in, in current culture. But as a leader, as a politician, as a military man, re just resilience. And he was a good intelligence officer. All you have to do is look at the minutia, the way he even corrected what we would call a cover for action, helping one of the culprit principles decide what kind of a cover story to use that was most effective. This is really way down in the weeds for the individual who's commanding the entire Continental Army. He's quite good. The British, uh, the, the British had some issues after Andre took over. I, I am not kind to Andre. Andre, I've read a couple biographies of Andre, and he was more of a staff officer in the social sense. He was very good in terms of pleasing his superiors. A couple of biographies have indicated he didn't have a lot of peer appreciation. Maybe he was a little bit of a, of a climber. He was not a good intelligence officer at all, and, and he screwed up the Arnold defection completely. Uh, he, he created the, the ultimate sin for any intelligence officer. He let the agent or would-be agent start to run the operation. You let the amateur who has their own reward system in place for what they want to do versus the professional who's supposed to know a lot more regarding operational security, long-term value, techniques, etc. cetera. Uh, so yeah, I, I think uh, to a large, you know, the British of course did have a lot of spies I could probably write a book on, on the British system. Uh, they had a great many spies because I have to disagree with my, my colleague here, the, the professional historian. And I think, I, I think it's very fair that the disagreement he has with me is as a historical professional who has read and considers scholarship within a cycle of scholarship and focus. But in, in uh, this case, you know, what we basically had was even at the start of the revolution, roughly, I have to play with percentages, but roughly one third for Britain, one third for the patriarchs, and one third who just wanted to survive and kind of went whichever way the wind was blowing and who, where the occupation forces were. That is a classic insurgency, and I'm afraid that both in terms of insurgency and united front, I simply have a different definition and a different set of the motivations and criteria. For example, Sam Adams, who I called the Lenin of the Revolution, he wanted political independence at least by 1765, if not earlier. Uh, how, was, how did John Hancock behave before the British impounded his ship? What would have been Nathaniel Greene's involvement had the British not impounded his ship? both of whom were trying to do what New Englanders did best, which was smuggle without paying taxes. The economic aspect of basically there was a poor administration, there was almost a wink and a nod and an agreement that you weren't going to have to pay the duties and the customs and the tariffs that were supposedly in the books but not reinforced. I'm not a Marxist. I don't necessarily have an economic determinalism. Uh, but I do think that was, regardless of how scholarship focuses, uh, from my point of view, I saw that as the motivation for individuals to a large degree. 
Now, let me see if I can answer a question about the Southern Campaign. Southern Campaign is very under, under studied, primarily because most of the important things were taking place in the North. The fighting with the Indians in the West, important too, but kind of peripheral. I did write a chapter where I did probably the only, the bulk of the original research I did in terms of finding spies and spy networks will be in the chapter on Green. Others were reinforcement or adding a different insight to it. But on Green, I think I, I identified his 25 key intelligence officers and discussed what their networks were like, what some individuals were. The one unique thing that I'm rather proud of as a researcher was the identification of the only British serving officer I could find who actually was a spy for the American side. And that was one that uh, worked for one of General Green's intelligence officers. Uh, I'm, I forgot a lot of the questions. The one, I'll talk about women very briefly. The colonial role of women was much different, obviously. They were seen as being subservient to their husbands. They played a, a significantly different role. They were very successful in terms of doing support activity, being couriers, running boarding houses, listening to what was being said because they were virtually ignored. Did a very good job from that point of view. But to find so many, I had a much easier time identifying African-American spies than I did women spies. If I was to name one more, because I didn't really focus that much on, on Europe, I would probably have mentioned Patience Wright, who was an American sculpturist, who Ben Franklin introduced into the social scene in London when he was still considered acceptable in London. She became an important social magnet, befriending King George and Queen Charlotte, uh, having the ability to apparently obtain good information, which she verbally passed to Franklin when he was in London and after he moved to Paris, actually traveling over from London to Paris to, uh, to talk with him. We don't know how she obtained her information other than her associations. We got two hints. One is that a newspaper describes that, that she was a very charming person who ran a salon where the nobility and distinguished men would come and, and Engage. And then secondly, we got a quote from Abigail Adams, typical New England woman who says she was the queen of the slucks. So, and I probably haven't answered everything, but I've run out of one here. Is there anything else, gentlemen, ladies, that I might respond to? Hey, we're going to turn it open and go over there to uh, <coughs> And please do us a favor, if you've got a, a particular individual you'd like to answer your question, point them out for us. This is for the author. Uh, I have a question in two parts. Is this type of activity also seen quite a bit in the French Revolution? And if so, can you recommend any good books on it? No, I'm sorry. I'm not a, not a historian. I would not endeavor to do that. It's almost like asking about the War of 1812. Did you get the impression that George Washington knew a lot of people? I mean, he just, I don't, I don't know what he, he had him at Fort Necessity, and then all of a sudden to the average Joey shows up in 1776. Did he, what did he do? Did he, did he know a lot of people in the United States at that time? After his initial campaign, in the French and Indian War, he actually was somewhat of a popular hero, certainly no one among the intelligentsia or the, the better classes throughout the, the colonies. Uh, his journal was, was published throughout all the colonies. It was right up in Boston as well as down in Virginia and in New York. He certainly did know a lot of people. I mean, it was not by accident, no matter what he said, that he showed up for the Continental Congress in his uniform, the only guy in uniform. And they were deciding who was going to be the uh, the commander in chief. A lot of times we get confused. We don't realize these people. Are it was a much. It, it was a. It was a much smaller, <laughs> smaller area, and, and particularly when you get into the field of counterintelligence, and you start talking about who Arnold knew, 
and who Arnold knew, who were subsequently knew other militia generals and other continental generals. Uh, it, yeah, it, it's a much smaller, smaller organization. Uh, this, the skills uh, that Washington had in the intelligence field, uh, these just don't come by naturally. Where did he learn these skills? Who taught him? Actually, most tradecraft is a function of a common sense approach, but a great deal of discipline. Now, you'll find that one of the things that helped him was the guide he used with X number of of specific phrases as to how an individual operates in a gentleman's society, and I, I note that in the book. Uh, the rest, I suspect, was just practical application. For example, disinformation. He knew that when he was talking to a group of Indians he was attempting to obtain support from to go against the French, that there was probably somebody there who was an Indian that was going to actually go tell the British what he said. So he made sure that he included just enough disinformation to the masses that this information was taken back by whatever member of the audience might do it versus the actual people that had to implement something. A lot of it is common sense and a lot of it is the very logical way that Washington as a personality approached life. There were no, he read several military books. Uh, there were no intelligence books per se that I'm aware of. But tradecraft really is common sense. And, and it, it's just a disciplined approach to, to how you do everything from elicitation to how you do meetings. There, there are no, you know, there, there is no puffery and magic to it. It's all common sense. Uh, other than honesty, what are a couple of other uh, problems with uh, Nathan Hale's uh, operations? Okay, first of all, he was given no instructions on how to possibly hide his notes. Now, he's, his cover for action was that he was a school teacher. I have a little problem with that, too, because if you know much about the British Army at the time, it's doubtful they were looking for extracurricular ed education while they were, they were moving through New York. But he would have, could have been carrying textbooks with, with him that he could have used a, a very simple stain in, or could have just used his own reminder notes, because no one would bother to look through what, what the various and sundry margin notes might be. Secondly, he was rather unique in his physical appearance. He was tall, slim, and he had a powder burn on his cheek. Now, I was supposed to be a, a school teacher, but those type of powder burns would be associated with an individual who used a musket very often, not just, not just a, uh, a hunter. Consequently, that would give it away. Also, he had served in New York City as a Continental officer. And indeed, in his journal, he indicates he actually paid someone for intelligence information. I forget what the amount was, five pounds or, or something like that. So he was known in the area this way. He had a cousin who was working as a Tory commissar, commissioner of some kind, who could have quite possibly identified him. And before Robert Rogers' role came out, the theory was that it had been the cousin who had identified him to British authorities. Uh, his requirements, there were no specific requirements. He was to wander and observe fortifications and strengths. The situation was moving so fast that by the time he got there, it was a, the requirements were no longer valid. He had no system for getting his communication out. There were no dead drops set up, no individuals he was given to whom he could pass information, etc., as you do in the chain. And finally, he had no exfiltration plan to speak of. Other than that, <laughs> also, quite frankly, he may have drank a little bit. I don't want to disparage him, but if you do read his, his biography and you look at this, he, he did like to drink. And maybe, particularly with Rogers, the drink helped him become a little bit more sure that Rogers was on his side. Rogers, however, was a very skilled, if nasty, intelligence officer. We have time for one more question. I have two items. <laughs> the comment made, nothing much happened between Monmouth and Yorktown. One most important thing that didn't happen is Washington didn't lose the army. He denied the 
British the opportunity to <coughs> engage him. You might want to call him the fox in that case because he just kept the British guessing. Second, in your research, um, did you find a chronology of the intelligence that was provided Washington um, source, consequence, how it was used? Not very often because he was very good operational security wise in terms of his official documents. You will find a letter that will refer to a missive he received from a, an officer that indicates it contained intelligence information and it was useful, but you will not find the reference point in his official correspondence. Or in some cases with, uh, what's a good example, Kosygin, who used to sign his, his information reports from New York with a Z. In the official correspondence, you find that uh, Washington writes back to Lord Sterling and says, this, you're very helpful intelligence information, blah, blah, blah. If you look and you're able to go into the drafts himself from his headquarters, you find that what he really said before it was crossed out was that the intelligence report from Z did so and so and so and so, but that was crossed out on the official correspondence. He was very good on operational security. Green, not, not as much so. That's why we really know so little. If it wasn't for the fact that Benjamin Talmadge and the Culper ring, particularly Woodhall, Woodruff and Townsend, kept some of their correspondence, we would obviously not have the set piece that we're able to look at with the Culpers. Oh, I gotta make one point about Agent uh, 355, famous from the Secret Six's fictional view of her. I'm, I'm like Alex Rose. You gotta use the microphone. Oh, I'm like Alex Rose. I do not believe she, she represented in a separate individual. I believe in the context of her one use in culprit communication that she represented Anne Nancy Armstrong, the individual who primarily was known for hanging out the laundry in a pattern that allowed the dead drop to be serviced. Uh, Secret Six goes into a long way of her romances and what have you, and a genealogy expert, and I don't have the reference with me, but a genealogy expert in New York City has pretty much debunked that, indicating when Townsend actually did get married, who the child was, the child later became a New York legislature member, et cetera. So I'm, when you read The Secret Six, you gotta understand you're reading a little bit of historical fiction. I mean, when they use exact quotes throughout the book in modern parlance, it gives you a little indication it may not be exactly well documented. Thank you very much, Ken. My pleasure, thank you.